Welcome back. Now we are going to be looking at divisions of skeleton. You can recall in our previous video, I said that divisions of skeleton is different from the types of skeleton. There are three types of skeleton, don't forget, endo, exo, and hydrostatic. Now the divisions of skeleton that we have are two, and they include the easier, the easier skeleton and the appendicular the appendicular skeleton all right so these are the two divisions of skeleton now to start with looking at asia skeleton now asia skeleton asia skeleton is made up of four different parts and what are the parts firstly we have the the skull then we have the um, ribs we have the ribs, we have the sternum. The sternum is also called the breastbone, the breastbone, and we have the vertebra column, the vertebra column, which is also called the backbone. All right. So, looking at the different parts that makes up the Asia skeleton, the first on the list is the skull. Let's quickly look at the skull now. For the skull, many persons believe that when we say skull, it only means this part, but it's not. It's every part above your neck that is considered to be the skull. All right. Now the skull is divided into two main regions or two main portions. And what are they? We have the cranium, which is also called the brain box, or in some texts they will say the brain case. And then we also have the facial bones. All right, so the cranium, which is the cranial bone, and the facial bones. Now, the total number of bones that are present in the skull are 22. So the skull is made up of 22 flat bones. And these bones are connected with the aid of a joint that is called suture joint. So they are held together firmly, and they do not permit any form of movement. Hence, I can say that suture joint is an example of Immovable joint. When we get to joint stages, then you get to understand that better. All right, coming back to the skull. Now, the skull, in terms of the bones that are present in the cranium, we have uh, about four different compartments or four different regions where these bones are actually divided into. And what are the divisions of these bones that are found in the cranium? Now, for the cranium, which is also called the brain box. We have four different bones present in four different regions, and they include we have the frontal, the frontal, we have the parental, we have the temporal, the temporal, and we have the occipital. So, in terms of the regions where they are found, the frontal is present at the front region. Okay, then while the parental, the parental is found in the middle, the center region. Then while the temporal is found at the sides, the sides regions, then while the occipital is present at the back, the back region, all right? And in this occipital, there's a large hole that is found at the occipital region, just at the base of the occipital region. Now that hole is called foramen, foramen magnum. Foramen magnum. Now this hole is what allows the passage of the spinal cord that is coming from the brain region and then it allows the passage into the uh, vertebra column all right so that's that about that then looking at the ribs the ribs now in man there are about 12 pairs of ribs meaning um, about 24 bones you know a pair is made up of two bones so there are, there are 12 pairs of ribs, making a total of 24 bones. And these pairs of ribs are divided into three main portions, or three main parts. Let me explain. Now, the first seven pairs are considered to be called true ribs. And why are they called true ribs? Because these first seven pairs are connected directly to the sternum. And not just a direct link to the sternum, but rather there is something that connects the first seven pairs to the uh, sternum. They call it the coaster cartilage. So I can say 
that the first seven pairs of ribs are connected to the costal cartilage, which in turn connects them to the um, sternum. All right. And then while the next three pairs are connected to the costal cartilage of the seventh pair. So it means that I can say that they are not directly connected to the sternum. They are connected to the seventh pair, which is connected directly to the sternum via the costal cartilage. So I can see that they are considered to be called false ribs. So we have the true ribs. Now the true ribs are the first seven pairs. Then we have the false ribs. The false ribs are the next three pairs. Then why we now have the last two pairs, which are considered to be floating ribs. Floating ribs. Now these floating ribs, they are unattached. They are not attached to the sternum at all. So they are only connected to the, uh, to the thoracic cavity. All right? Not that they are connected to the sternum. Now, if you look at a typical uh, image of a uh, rib, you get to know that it can take this pattern, just like a bone connected. Now, you notice that the body of the rib is considered to be called the shaft. The shaft. Then, while this head is called the capitulum, and close to it is called the tobaculum. Tobaculum. All right? The capitulum and the tuberculum. Now, the capitulum, the capitulum and the tuberculum, they are connected to the um, sternum. So the part of the rib that is connected to the sternum is known as the capitulum and the tuberculum together. The while that of the anterior end being this part is the one that is connected to the thoracic cavity. All right. So, we know the different compartments of the ribs. And of course, you should know that ribs, they actually help or enhance uh, breathing movement or breathing action. So, that's even the reason why one of the functions of skeleton is that it can aid in what? In proper breathing action. All right? Of course, you know that from this one, I've just explained it when I was explaining the ribs, that the sternum, they act as surface of attachment of what? Of the ribs. All right? And then lastly, we have the vertebral column. So let's look at the vertebra, uh, vertebral column in details. Now, considering the vertebral column, remember I said that the vertebral column is also called the backbone. The backbone. All right? Never should you mistake the vertebral column for the uh, spinal cord. It is the vertebral column that helps to protect the spinal cord that runs from the head region into the uh, back region. All right. So what tends to protect it is actually the vertebral column, also called the back bone. All right. A typical image of a vertebral column looks like this. Of course, looking at this image, we have this uh, protrusion here or projection here to be known as the neural, the neural spine. So that is neural spine. And the function of this neural spine is that it serves as a surface of attachment for muscles. All right? Then these projections that are uh, poking out here, together they are called the transverse session or transverse process. Transverse process. All right? And they also function in serving as surface of attachment for muscles as well, just like in the case of the neural spine. Then you see this hole here, this hole, this one is called the neural canal, the neural canal. And the neural canal helps in the passage of the spinal cord. Remember, it is the spinal cord that runs inside the, what, the vertebral column. And the path which which it passes through is actually called the neural canal, all right? And then you see this big, hole or circle here is called the central and the central helps in the provision of support and serves as a surface of attachment for the intervertebral disc all right so it is also very very important then around this region for a typical cervical vertebra you have what is called the vertebrarial canal the vertebrarial canal now, this actually uh, permits the passage of blood vessels and nerves into um, that vertebral canal, supplies the 
vertebrae with um, nutrients, all right, by allowing the passage of nerves and uh, blood vessels. That is actually uh, uh, present in only the cervical vertebra. So I'm going to be giving you uh, tips on how you can know the ones that are present in so many vertebrae as well as their functions, all right? So now coming back, looking at the vertebral column, there are five portions or divisions of the vertebral column, and they include one, we have the cervical vertebra. We have the cervical vertebra. Then two, we have the thoracic, the thoracic vertebra. Then three, we have the lumbar, the lumbar vertebra. Then four, we have the sacral, the sacral vertebra. And five, we have the caudal, the caudal vertebra. All right? So these are the five portions or divisions of the vertebral column. The first is the cervical vertebra. Let's see the different regions where they, are, where they are found in the body. For the cervical vertebra, this one is present in the neck region. It's present in the neck region. Then while the thoracic is present in the chest region. The chest region. Then the lumbar is found in the loin, the loin region, or you can call it abdominal region, abdominal region, all right? Then we also have the sacral. This one is present in the hip region, the hip region. Then while the cauda is present in the tail region, all right? So these are the different regions where you can find the different uh, vertebrae. All right. Now, for the uh, vertebrae of man, now there are three prominent uh, organisms that they usually test the ability on the number, especially those of you that are writing uh, jam as well as why. So what I will do is that I'm going to give you the three organisms, which includes man, rabbit, and rat, and show you their different uh, vertebrae in terms of their numbers. Now let's quickly look at that. Now considering uh, these are the vertebrae, the vertebrae, and then we have, uh, these are the organisms, so we have man, we have rabbit and rat. So this is man, rabbit, and rat, all right? Then for the cerveca, remember that this is present in the neck region, so we have uh, man to be seven, and rabbit seven, and rat seven. Then the thoracic, now man is 12, the rabbit is 12 to 13, and white rat is 13. Okay, then we have the lumbar, the lumbar, man is 5, 5, then white rabbit is 6 to 7, and rat is 6. Then we have the sacra, and this is also five in man. Then, while this one is uh, four to five, and while this one is, or uh, this is three to four, yes, while this is four, and then we have the cauda. Then, the cauda man is four, then, while this one is. 16 and this is 27 to 30. So what we get the sum when you add up everything here, it gives you 33 bones. So in this case, this becomes 7 plus 12, that's 19, 25, and 25, that's 28, and 28 to this 16, that's 44. 44 to 47, yeah, 44 to 47. Then while well, this one is 57 to 60, all right? So that's it. So it means that in rats, there are more of the vertebrae than even in rabbits as well as in man. So in man, please take up business of man. This one is still very, very important. There are 33 vertebrae present in man. So you can quickly pause the video and take down these um, notes. For the bar of being on the board now. Then let's see some important points to consider on the vertebrae. The first vertebrae is cervical. Now looking at the cervical vertebrae, remember that it is present in 
the um, neck region. And mind you, before I move on to looking at the cervical vertebrae, please take a, uh, pay, pay attention to this. Now, the vertebrae that is constant across all mammals is actually the cervical. Remember that in man, rabbit, and rat just now, we had 777 indicating that you have the same number of cervical vertebrae in mammals, no matter how long the neck is. You know, it's, it's present in the neck region. So as long as the neck of giraffe and as short as the neck of rat, they both contain the same number of um, cervical vertebrae being seven. All right. So looking at the cervical vertebrae, one unique feature of the cervical vertebrae is that it contains what is called the vertebrateria canal. And remember, I said that it is the canal that allows the passage of um, blood vessels to supply nutrients. So it's only present in cervical vertebrae. All right. And mind you, among the seven cervical vertebrae, the first cervical vertebrae is called the atlas. Atlas is considered to be the first cervical vertebrae. Then, why axis is considered to be the second cervical vertebrae. So get this thing straight. Atlas is the first, axis is the second. And what distinguishes the atlas from the axis is that atlas do not have any centrum. So no centrum is present in atlas. But in axis, there is what? There is the presence of centrum. And it is the centrum that actually projects to forming a pokey uh, substance, which is called the odontoid process. So odontoid process is actually present in axis, is not found in atlas, because it's just like the continuing part of the central present in axis. And of course, odontoid process enhances the rotatory movement of the head. All right, so don't forget that. But every other component is still present, the facets. Of course, if you look at this, these are considered to be the facets of a typical vertebrae. Facets. All right, they are the facets. And of course, when we say facets, we are referring to uh, the part of a vertebrae that tends to enhance the fitting of intervertebral disc as well as even the vertebrae sitting on top of each other. All right, so it enhances the fitting of a vertebrae over another vertebrae. And of course, uh, the one that tends to, to project or the one that faces inward and upward, that's the facet that faces or projects inward and upward is called the prezygophysis. Then while the one that tends to uh, project outward and downward is considered to be called the postzygophysis. Alright? So these are actually considered to be facets. So don't forget that. And they help to fit in our vertebrae on each other or one another. Okay? Then again, uh, the vertebrae that is characterized by a very thick centrum is called the lumbar. The lumbar vertebrae is characterized by a very thick centrum. And if you look at the centrum of the lumbar, the reason for the thickness of the centrum is because it is the lumbar vertebrae that tends to bear the weight of the body. In fact, it is even the vertebrae that tends to support pregnant women during pregnancy. Of course, so in case you see a question on that, what vertebrae supports uh, a pregnant woman is actually the lumbar, but it's found in the abdominal region, don't forget that. And again, uh, for the cauda, the cauda, remember I said that the cauda is present in the tail region. Of course, uh, man, according to evolution, it was believed to, to be that man once had tails, but uh, due to um, disuse, we are not working with it, they degenerated to form a large mass of bones that are called cosics. But mind you, this cosix is considered to be a vestigial organ because it's an organ without a known function. All right? Then, looking at the cauda, the cauda vertebrae is still unique in its own way in that it lacks uh, the neural canal, so no neural canal and no, no neural spine. All right? So that's the unique thing about the cauda. All right? So just take cognizance of everything that I've said, the basic things about 
the vertebrae. And don't forget that the generalized function of the vertebral colon is that it serves, it serves as a protective co covering for the spinal cord. All right? So that's that about that. Then let's progress to looking at the appendicular skeleton. Looking at the appendicular skeleton, we have uh, it to be divided, that's for the appendicular skeleton, to be divided into two parts. And what are the two parts of the appendicular skeleton? The limbs and the limb gedus. The limbs and the limb gedus. All right? So we have the uh, the appendicular skeleton to be divided into the limbs and the limb gedus. Then we have the asia skeleton to be divided into the, uh, the skull, the ribs, the sternum, also called the breastbone, and the vertebral column. All right? So don't mistake one for the other. Now looking at the limbs, the limbs are divided into two parts. And what are these? We have the four limbs. We have the four limbs and we have the hind limbs. The four limbs and the hind limbs. All right? Now, both limbs, eh, they follow a plan. And the plan is called the pentadactyl plan. Okay? When we say penta, the word penta means five. All right? So, and dactyl means digits. So, it means that we have five digits of arrangement of the four limbs as well as what? The hind limb. So now, we are going to look at the bones of the forelimb. The first bone of the forelimb is called the humerus. The humerus. And the humerus is immediately followed by two long bones that are called ulna and radius. Then these ulna and radius are followed immediately by the wrist bones. The wrist bones, which are also called the carpals. Carpals. Then, while the wrist bones, they are immediately followed by the uh, palm bones, which are also called the metacarpals. All right, metacarpals. And lastly, they are followed by the phalanges. The phalanges. All right. So you see it now. Just one, two, three, four, five. You see. So now the humerus, being this long bone, is followed by the ulna and radius, which are placed side by side. These ones. And then, then the, the honor and radius are immediately followed by the wrist bones, which are these ones. There are about eight in number that are arranged in three rows, all right? And they are called carpals. Then, well, they are immediately followed by the palm bones, which are also called the metacarpals. And lastly, they are followed by the phalanges, all right? Then, in the case of the hind limb, the first bone of the hind limb is called the femur. The femur and the femur, which is also called the thigh bone, is considered to be the longest bone, the longest bone in the body. All right, and then it is followed by two long bones, which are considered to be called fibula and tibia. Fibula and tibia. This fibula and tibia are now followed by the ankle bones. The ankle bones. Now, the ankle bones are also called the tarsal bones or tarsals, all right? And then the tarsals are now followed by the metatarsals. And then lastly, they are followed by the phalanges. You see the twist? So one, two, three, four, five. So that's called the pentadactyl plan, all right? So let's go over it again. Humerus being this one. Then honor and radius. Again, radius is thicker and larger than the honor. Why the honor is longer than the radius? And then we have the wrist bones, and then we have the palm bones, also called the metacarpals, and lastly the phalanges. Then for this one, we have the femur, we have the fibula, tibia, then we have the uh, ankle bones. Of course, the tibia is larger than the fibula, while the fibula is longer than the tibia. Then the ankle bones, which are considered to be the tarsal bones. And then we have the metatarsals, which are considered to be the feet bones. And then lastly, we have the phalanges. All right? Then that's that about the uh, limbs. So take cognizance of their limbs. Then the next is the limb gedus. The limb gedus. When we talk about the limb gedus, what are we referring to? There are two divisions of the limb gedus. 
we have the pectoral girdle, we have the pectoral girdle, and then we have the pelvic girdle. The pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle. Generally, the limb girdles they help to attach the limbs to the asia skeleton. I'll go on about that again. The limb girdles help to attach the limbs to the asia skeleton, be it the forelimb or the hindlimb. So the, the one that attaches the forelimb, which is this one, to our asia skeleton is considered to be called the pectoral girdle. So this one helps to connect the forelimb, the forelimb to the asia skeleton. All right. Then while this pelvic girdle connects the hind limb, connects the hind limb to the asia skeleton. So please don't mistake one for the other. All right. So how does the pectoral girdle help to connect the forelimb? to the Asia skeleton. So let's see the components of the pectoral girdle. The components of the pectoral girdle. So as we know the function, how it connects the four limbs to the Asia skeleton. All right, so looking at the pectoral, that's the pectoral girdle now. The pectoral girdle. Now, there are two main components of the pectoral girdle, and they are the scapula, the scapula and we also have the collarbones, the collarbones. Now this collar, the scapula is also called the shoulder blade. That's another name for it. Then while well, the collarbones are also called the clavicles. All right. So there is actually a protrusion of the scapula that tends to serve as a surface of attachment of the collarbones. Just like you can be having something like this, and then you have, let's say this is our scapula. And of course, let's say we not have it to be connected to this bone. Now, of course, this protrusion coming from the scapula is called the coracoid process. So it is the coracoid process that serves as a surface of attachment of the collarbones to the scapula. All right. And then, of course, the collarbones, there's a part that is connected to the scapula and the other part is connected to the thoracic. Cavity. So these are the two main components of the pectoral. Then again, in the scapula, there is a cavity that tends to serve as a surface of attachment of the head of the humerus of the forelimb. You know, the first part of the forelimb is the humerus. So the head of the humerus fits into a cavity at the scapula, and that cavity is called the glenoid cavity. So in case you are asked, what cavity does the head of the humerus fit into? It's called the glenoid cavity, all right? So basically, the function of the pectoral head is just to connect the forelimb to the asia skeleton, all right? Then let's quickly consider the, the uh, pelvic girdle. Now looking at the pelvic girdle, that is the one that connects the hind limb to the asia skeleton, uh, we have the pelvis, now listen, the, the pelvis is actually a very large bone or large bones, two large bones that are held together by a joint, which is a kind of immovable joint called the pubic, pubic symphysis. Pubic symphysis. So it is the pubic symphysis as a joint that holds the two large pelvic bones together. Each pelvic bone, meaning each large pelvic bone, is made up of three smaller bones. And what are these three small bones that makes up the, each of the pelvic bones? So the pelvic bone now is made up of three small bones. And what are they? We have the ilium, ilium, then we have the ischium, ischium, and then we have the pubis. All right? So these are the three bones that makes up the pelvic bone. But well, meanwhile, I take cognizance of the fact that there is the existence of um, a spelling known as ilium, which is spelled like this. So just a difference in the letter E being replaced with I. -E. This exists too in biology. The one with the E is a part of the small intestine, which is a portion of the small intestine. You know, we have three main portions of the small intestine. If you can visit my uh, video on uh, nutrition, you get to know that we have three main portions. And what are they? 
We have the ileum, the duodenum, and the jejunum. Of course, you know that the ileum being the portion is the terminating end of the lesson, which is the one with the E. But the one with the I is the portion of the pelvis. All right? So this is even considered to be the largest, while this one is considered to be the smallest. All right? Then, at these two points, these ones, the points where they meet, there is a large bone, or hole rather, that is formed. That hole is called obturator foramen. Obturator foramen. Now, this hole that is formed when these two meet or articulate, at that point where they meet, there is a large hole that is formed there, which is called obturator foramen. This obturator foramen is actually what serves as a passageway for blood vessels as well as nerves. And it also enhances the flexibility of the pelvis. All right? So now, if you consider the pelvis thoroughly, you get to know, remember, the function of the pelvic girdle is simply to connect the hindley to where? To the asia skeleton. So it means there must be a surface or a kind of um, hole or cavity that the head of the femur will articulate. So in the pelvis, that part that bears the head of the femur is called the acetabulum. Just like the part of the scapula that bears the head of the humerus, which is called the glenoid cavity, I said that before. So the part of the pelvis that bears the head, or in which the head of the femur fits into, is called the acetabulum. So don't forget that. All right. So we have just considered the uh, the asia skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. All right. So we are done with that of the divisions of skeleton. Please take note of all these things that I've just said. If it means you to you know revisit the video over and over again for you to get a clear concept, then you do it. Generally, we look at the last being the function of skeleton. We have said that before. Of course, the function of skeleton is something that is not supposed to be hard for any student. Um, we have diverse functions of the skeleton. And what are some of the functions of skeleton? The functions of skeleton. Now, the first function is that one, it provides support. Provides support. Then two, it provides, provides shape to organisms, all right? Then three, it helps in movement. Of course, you should know the reason why skeleton helps in movement, because um, the, 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 they are connected to muscles, and muscles enhances movement. So of course, just imagine, picture this way, that there are no, no skeletal materials. How can an organism move from one place to another, especially animals? to be very, very impossible, all right? So that's it. Then also it helps in breathing, breathing too. It helps in breathing process, all right? It helps in breathing process and quite other functions are still there too. So um, it's my hope that you've been able to understand the concept of skeleton. We still have quite a number of things to cover. So just stay tuned to this channel, always follow up. Make sure that you like the videos and then you place your questions in the comment section. Anything that you are not clear with, you can place it in the comment section and then we'll trash everything together. So it's my hope that you've been able to understand everything that I've just explained. If you still do not understand, revisit the video and then you understand it. Uh, thanks for watching and make sure you don't forget to um, subscribe to this channel, tell your friends about it and you, you will be so happy that indeed you are a member of this uh, channel. God bless for watching. I'll speak to you.